In these Masters of the Air clips, we see bomber gunners defending the formation by firing at German bomber interceptors. The cartridge belt mixes contain tracers, and the gunners are firing at basically anything that moves. The intent of this video is to fact check the ammo belt mixes adopted and bomber gunnery tactics by comparing them to the actual ammo loadouts and gunnery tactics adopted. This image shows the 8 to 9 gun stations on the B-17F model. We will be focusing in on the flexible mount stations located in the tail, waist positions, radio room, cheek, and nose positions. We will look at the ball and upper turret gun usage in a future video. The three goals of bomber gunners are described on this page from a declassified 1946 National Defense Research Committee document titled Analytical Studies in Aerial Warfare. Don't get shot down. Protect the other bombers in your formation by mutual crossfire support and destroying the enemy bomber interceptors. The ammo belt mixes and gunnery tactics were changed throughout the war, taking into account changing interceptor threats and vulnerabilities and lessons learned. There were four main types of 50 caliber cartridges adopted by bomber gunners, as shown on this table from a declassified 1944 aircrew gunnery manual. The table columns represent the cartridge name, target type, bullet tip color, and bullet characteristics. The main advantage of tracers is that they emit a bright visible light. This can help in aiming. Characteristics and a cutaway of the M1 tracer is shown on this image from a 1942 Aberdeen Proving Ground Ordnance School manual titled Ammunition General. The bullet's tracer compound fill is shaded here. The bullet's velocity equates to 2,830 feet per second. The bullet weighs 681 grains and the tracer compounds weigh 70 grains. The tracer compound is ignited by the powder charge and burns with a red flame that is vis visible by the eye, even in daylight. Bullet ballistics of the tracer round are roughly the same as the other 50 caliber bullets. The matching bullet ballistics are valid out to around 1,500 yards. Tracers mixed in bomber gunner ammo belts have advantages. As discussed on this March 1945 Army Air Forces Historical Studies document titled Flexible Gunnery Training in the AAF. Tracers assist in gun-to-sight harmonization and assist in accounting for a moving target's lead required. However, the gunner is observing the tracer's light, not the bullet. A tracer's light gives a false impression to the bullet's distance from the gunner. The tracer's light size is not proportional to the light's distance. In early bomber operation, gunners were provided ammo belts with repeating mixes of one tracer for every four armor-piercing cartridges. This is a standard World War II 50 caliber ammo crate. It contains 265 linked rounds and weighs 98 pounds. The linked ammo mix in the crate is a repeating four armor-piercing and a single tracer. These images show the four armor-piercing and single tracer ammo crates. To increase the bullet's effectiveness against flammable targets, incendiary cartridges were added to the mix. The revised ammo mix changed to two armor-piercing, two incendiaries, and a single tracer. The mix became known as the 221. These images show the 221 ammo crates. This chart outlines a review of the Masters of the Air series episode timeline to help aid in discussion. The columns are the episode number, time span of the episode, episode target location and type, and story timeline. A summary of the 8th Air Force's target priorities was added for reference. Tracers were included in all episodes where air-to-air -air battles occurred. Tracers should only have been shown in episodes 1 through 6. In real life, they should have not been used in episode 7. No air-to-air -air battles occurred in episodes 8 or 9. By November 1943, tracers had been removed from the ammo mixes, as discussed in this November 1943 100th Bomb Group monthly summary narration. Despite gunner criticism, removal of the tracers from the ammo mixes, bomber gunnery has improved. So why were tracers removed from the ammo mix at the end of 1943? A summary of the change is discussed on this page from a 1983 Office of Air Force History document titled The Army Air Forces in World War II, Volume 6. Bomber gunners were trained on various methods for tracking and ranging enemy aircraft. All of these methods were too complicated. Tracers were adopted experimentally to aid in targeting. Tracers gave erroneous impressions of the bullet's path. Tracer target sighting never gained wide acceptance. A study showed bomber gunners who had tracers usually just winged it and completely ignored their gun sights. The problem with tracers is that they play false tricks in the true bullet trajectory and the tracer's light behavior is different than the bullet's behavior. The light may show the bullets curving in flight when they do not. This may show target strikes when the target is missed. 
This page from a November 1943 Positions Firing Training Manual titled Get That Fighter indicates don't depend on tracers, they may fool you. The British also evaluated the benefits of tracers as discussed in this historical review number 6, RCAF Heavy Bomber Group European Theater Appendix. In February 1945, the RAF stopped using tracers. The value of tracers was always in doubt. Usage of the gyro gun sight was a deciding factor. This report goes further, indicating that tracer ballistics were poor and were useless in assisting in aiming. The new position firing method was adopted by bomber gunners in October of 1943. The methods it replaced were considered too complex to be practical. Up to October 43, bomber gunners were using the complex either apparent speed or relative speed targeting systems for tracking, ranging, and firing. After October 43, bomber gunners switched to the position firing method. This is around the same time tracers were eliminated. Application of the older targeting system was inadequate, even when properly applied. Gunners were aiming in the opposite lead direction needed to strike the enemy aircraft. The five-step old relative speed system is outlined here. This is a gunnery sighting system that should have been adopted in the Masters of the Air episodes 1 through 6. Identify enemy aircraft. Estimate effective range at 600 yards. Let the plane pass across your stationary gun sight for one second to determine the correct speed differential between your bomber and the interceptor. Lead the target based on a memorized table. In practical application, by the time these steps were followed, the interceptor will be long gone. Think about the gunner following those steps in this clip. The attack sequence has been slowed down to one-third its normal speed. Adoption of the position firing system was a turning point in flexible gunnery target sighting when implemented in 1943 and 1944. This page outlines the new position firing system. Position firing is based on three rules. It is more effective than any other system. The rules are valid only for flexible mount ring sight and post sighted guns. The three rules are listed here. Only fire on fighters attacking you flying a pursuit curve path. Always aim between him and your bomber's tail. Account for proper deflection based on his cone position to the bomber. Don't waste ammo. Open fire when within range. The main rule is, only fire on fighters making attack runs, flying a pursuit curve. This chart shows a standard beam pursuit curve attack. The fighter maintains a continuous attack profile, decreasing his lead as he gets closer. He will be aiming ahead of the bomber, but the distance ahead of the bomber he aims for decreases as he gets closer. Large distance lead, small distance lead. He will be flying a smooth, continuous path. Position firing rules only apply when he attacks like this. This is what the bomber gunner would observe from a beam pursuit attack. While in a pursuit attack, the fighter's nose points towards the bomber. It will appear the fighter is sliding in towards the bomber. The line shown is the fighter's apparent motion. He is getting bigger because he's getting closer. To be clear, only fire at fighters attacking you flying the pursuit curve when within range. Don't fire at fighters not attacking, like flying alongside the bomber, even if at point-blank range. For accurate ranging and deflection, the gunner needs to maintain a 20-inch sight base. The distance from the gunner's mark one eyeball to the 35 mil rad ring sight. Range is estimated by referencing the interceptor's wingspan relative to the ring sight, like in these images. The effective range for position firing system is 600 yards. Okay, test time. Given these rules, which FW-190 would you fire upon? Press the spacebar to stop and start the video while I go get a cold one. Only H and G are within the 600 yard range and flying an attack pursuit curve. I and E are within range but hold your fire since they are not flying a pursuit curve. The frequency of German pursuit attacks on bombers is discussed on this page from a National Defense Research Committee document titled Analytical Studies in Aerial Warfare. The interceptors were flying along a pursuit curve in 95% of all attacks on bombers. A confirming analysis was conducted by assessing 285 attacks. Some type of pursuit curve path was followed. The bomber gunner will need to aim between the fighter and the bomber's tail. Don't try to lead the target by aiming in front of the fighter's nose. Deflection is a distance you offset your aim from the attacking airplane towards the bomber's tail. This image shows the cone deflection rats the bomber gunner needs to memorize. 
This is a rad graphic for a level attack. A rad is the radii of the 35 mil rad ring sight. No rad offsets are needed for the 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock attacks, as these are no deflection shots. If the fighter is at the 9 o'clock level position relative to the waist gunner and in range, then the gunner will need to aim three rads towards the tail of the bomber in space. He will aim at point B. The reason you deflect your aim towards the bomber's tail is the bomber's forward speed will carry the bullet forward, so you aim aft to counteract this effect. The beauty of this system is that the rad offsets needed are independent of the fighter speed or distance from the gunner. I know it seems counterintuitive, but if the plane is under attack like this, you will aim along this path in space towards your tail. The bullets will strike the plane. Summarizing position firing key point rules. They only apply to flexible mount 35mm rad ring sight guns, not bomber gun stations equipped with computing gun sights. Only fire at fighters that are attacking, flying a pursuit curve, or a fly through. Estimate its cone angle and account for rad deflection. In episodes 1 through 6, the waste gunners were firing at anything that moved, likely using tracers as their sighting system given the speed of battle. The mission to Berlin in episode 7 occurred in March of 1944. This is five months past the changeover to tracer elimination and adoption of the position firing sighting system. The gunners in this mission would all be well trained in position firing and all gun stations would be using 100% armor piercing incendiary rounds, no tracers. In this episode 7 clip, the waste gunners are firing at interceptors not flying a pursuit curve and all gun stations are firing tracers. We know tracers were eliminated five months earlier, and in this March 8th post-mission crew suggestion list, item 1 indicates some gunners want tracers added to the ammo mix. By March of 1944, bomber ammo belts would have shifted to 100% armor-piercing incendiary cartridges in lieu of the 221 mix. This is based on several sources. This page from a headquarters 8th Air Force document titled Major Problems and Accomplishments in 1944 discusses cartridges adopted by bomber gunners in 1944. In early 1944, the armor-piercing incendiary 50 caliber cartridges were introduced. They had both armor-piercing and incendiary qualities. It had improved gunnery by an additional advantage of showing strikes on targets. This row shows characteristics of the armor-piercing incendiary cartridge. This table from a 1945 Armaments and Air War document summarizes the cartridges adopted by U.S., British, and German Air Forces. Allied fighter and bomber ammo loadouts are listed. The end-of-war U.S. bomber, gunner, and fighter ammo loadouts consist of 100% armor-piercing incendiary rounds. Note the British and German Air Forces also abandoned tracers. In summary, the episodes 1 through 6 gunnery narrations reflected period sighting and ammo loadouts. Episode 7 did not reflect either gunnery position firing methods or ammo loadouts used during that period. If you've enjoyed these Masters of the Air deep dive fact check videos and found them worthy of your time, please consider commenting and or liking the video.